just like that. <laughs> hey everybody, it's Old School Hard back with another review for you guys. So first things first, if you're not a subscriber to the channel, please hit the subscription button below. Please thumbs up this video if you want to see similar videos such as this. Please also share this video on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, wherever you can share this video. That would be great. Please also leave your comments below. If you've been through a similar situation such as Khalif's or your family uh, family member who's seen a family member go through um, something such as Khalif's story, please leave your comments below. Let's discuss some things that we can do to uh, change uh, these outcomes and change these types of injustices. Let's uh, discuss um, uh, just different things that we can do in our community to stop things like this from happening. I want this to be an open forum once again. And so I would like you guys to leave comments so that we can discuss them. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to already, I do reviews on um, all of the episodes thus far. So this episode is review of episode five, but I have done four, three, two, and one. If you want to go back and take a look at those, go ahead and then come back here and enjoy episode five. So episode five for me was really deep, and I don't know if anyone caught that the way that I caught it. And so um, basically, I just want to talk about what I got from episode five more so than give you a recap of episode five. So for me, um, the beginning of episode five was um, basically how they pretty much one night just let Khalif Broder leave Rikers Island with the Metro car to return home. Um, and... For me, it just put me in the mindset of what I would assume uh, the end of slavery was like. Um, and hopefully you kind of caught the similarities there as well. Um, if you look at Khalif's story, uh, just injustice from the get-go. So he's falsely accused and arrested and he's given an amount of time. He's punished for things that he shouldn't be punished for. Um, he's made to deal with things he shouldn't have to deal with. He's beaten. Um, he's not given food and water. Um, he's not um, being taken care of mentally. Um, and so the similarities are there for, for uh, post-slavery and uh, Khalif Browder's story. And so I found it, this aha one in my brain is like, I really, he's really giving me vision of what it was like to, for a black male um, to walk away from slavery, but still have that hurt, pain, anger, frustration, mental health issues, fear, um, that the black man had um, going through what they went through. Um, and it's just it's just crazy that his story is just giving me um, that image and I can't shake it out of my mind because it's so deep embedded. And so I, I can see how the slave, you know, it's it's fine and release, but he's he's fearful. He's a little, uh, a bit, uh, has psychosis probably. Um, he is overprotective. He is um, dangerous in some, in some, and I wouldn't say dangerous, but I would say um, strong-minded, um, paranoid, um, hungry. Uh, fearful, um, all of that uh, wrapped in one. And that's what we see in this episode. We see the effects of um, post-jail with post-incarceration with Khalif. And so Khalif returns back home to his family. Um, his sister said, you know, when he came back, he was like really quiet and she was just like, he wasn't himself. I just don't feel like he was himself. And um, if you think about it, you know, when somebody is incarcerated and they're just put in this space, 
then that that mindset is not going to leave very quickly. You know, it's going to take them a while to adjust to their surroundings. And when somebody's gone for three years, things have totally changed. Um, and he has to adjust to that. And he has to adjust very quickly because here you are, you're coming into a new age. iPhones are coming like every five months. Uh, there are new computers. Books are being read. There's new rappers out there's new types of gym shoes. There's not Air Force Ones anymore. There's, you know, uh, retro Jordans that people are wearing, Timberlands. We don't wear Nietzsche anymore. We wear this, we wear that. And so he's having to adjust to all of it. And then he's having to adjust missing out on three years without his family. And you can imagine that was a lot on Khalif. So of course, Khalif goes through a number of things while um, he is back out um, with his family. <clears throat> uh, they said that he would uh, zone out. Um, <clears throat> they uh, spoke of one instance where he was uh, trying to commit suicide and he was peeing on the floor and his mom recounts the time where he was talking to bottles. So um, they, uh, he uh, tried to uh, attempt suicide. Um, and he always talks about like his fears and things that he thought was going to happen to him. And one of the things that he feared the most is having to go back and uh, people watching him and following him. Because what happened was because they just like one random night, like let him out of jail, Khalid's brother was like, no, like none of this makes any sense at all. So that's when, of course, we see that his attorney come into play and they filed this huge $20 million lawsuit against the city, against uh, New York uh, Department of Corrections, on Rikers Island, on district attorney. And so um, uh, because of that, you know, Khalif started to have these ideations that things were happening to him. And to be honest with him, you know, his brother even said, like, you know, at the same time, there were cars parked down the street from their house that was unmarked. There was a police car across the street from their house and things of that nature. So, I mean, to be honest, you know, he was very fearful. And I think that they were at some point point watching him but I also feel like you know because of what he dealt with and what he was dealing with um that it also caused um schizophrenia it also caused paranoid schizophrenia um which he was already suffering from from being in solitary confinement um for a long time at such a young age and not having any humor human interaction. So you can see the similarities of slavery um, uh, the same way. And then you wonder why, you know, people go, you know, oh, you guys didn't deal with that. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That was a long time ago. But you can see how it can affect every year, every, uh, every aspect of your life. And it can uh, push off into your offspring you know, and your offspring can, can start to think the same way. And so um, I most definitely, everything that Khalif went through in this episode reminded me of some part of post-slavery. Um, and so uh, a couple of other things that um, I found very interesting. Well, they say he attempted suicide and they had already had him on uh, Respiradone. I believe it was Respiradone. Yes, Respiradone. If it's not Respiradone, I do apologize. And Respiradone is a medicine that you give for psychosis, but unfortunately, it causes depression, it causes suicidal ideation, um, blurred vision, um, tunnel vision. Uh, basically, you don't feel like yourself uh, at all. And it's funny because this is the medicine given if you're paranoid schizophrenic and it gives you these symptoms. Uh, just as si just similar to cancer, which uh, chemotherapy does exactly um, the same thing. It, it it causes all of these symptoms that you're already dealing with uh, with cancer. It's just as harmful to you, uh, basically, is what I'm saying. 
Um, and so he just talked about, you know, after he had went through that, he had realized that he did actually want to live. He actually did want to, you know, start the, uh, start a life, which was kind of cool. So although, you know, you go through these periods on respiradone where you do feel suicidal, where you do feel helpless and hopeless. It does kind of help with the ideations a little bit. So he was able to um, try to start um, a life. So they said he passed his GED on the first try. He got into uh, a Brooklyn Community College and majored in business, business management. And they said whatever they asked Khalif to do, Khalif was able to do it. Like he excelled in everything. He was still very, very, very quiet, very to himself. And um, still dealt with a lot of ideations and things of that nature. Um, so, um, now the reason why we know about Khalif is because of the story in the New Yorker. Um, and that's how I think I heard about it. If it wasn't the New Yorker, I heard about it from the Huffington Post. And so basically this lady reached out to him and asked him, you know, could she interview him? He said, yes. And, you know, basically from that point on, the story took off to where he was meeting um, Jay-Z. Uh, he did an interview with Huffington Post where he told his story with his attorney. And then he also met Rosie O'Donnell and he was featured on The View. And um, Rosie O'Donnell almost made me cry because she had tears in her eyes. The compassion that she felt and the love she felt for Khalif was genuine, you know, and you don't find that very often. Um, and I think that she really did have a, a, a love relationship for him and felt for him. Um, and so he goes on the view and he tells his story and it's so crazy because he doesn't speak a lot, but the one thing that he keeps saying is that I cannot let them slide on this. I cannot let this go. I will not let this go. This is what happened to me. And I'm telling my story. It is what it is. I cannot let this go. And I feel like that I keep going back to slavery because I'm not going to let it go. Like, I'm just like Khalif, like, you know, listening to those stories, hearing those stories, hearing the injustices, being, uh, our people being beat and raped and, uh, um, made to do things that they weren't supposed to do and dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and psychosis and fear and all of that. I'm not going to let it go. Like I tell people that all the time, people always get mad at me because I'm like, we deserve something. You know, if we don't get reparations in the money form, we deserve land. We deserve houses. We deserve it all. I am just like Khalif. Like, I feel like we shouldn't just go, oh, let's just let this slide. Let's just take the plea deal. And to me, the plea deal for us, <laughs> this is going to sound funny. The plea deal for us is, well, we're letting you in our colleges. You have every uh, opportunity available to you. You know, you can, you know, eat at any restaurant. You can go to a college. You can take out a loan. You know, we're giving you what you need. That's a plea deal to me. That's what we have been going through plea deals since slavery. And basically, I feel like Cleve. No, I'm not going. <laughs> like, y'all owe me more than that. I went through so much. You owe me more than this plea deal. You owe me time. You owe me and he didn't even really want money, but you owe me time, you owe me money, and you owe me an apology, and you owe me a chance to take back what you took from me. And I feel like it's just a similar link. And of course, Khalif is not the only one. You know, we know already by looking at documentaries like Slavery by Another Name, looking at documentaries like Michelle Alexander's The uh, New Jim Crow, that this is nothing new. But his story is um, so unique because he's so young, you know, and uh, to have that fight and that drive was just amazing. So uh, they also go through that deposition uh, where basically uh, the lawyers are trying to concoct some type of plan to discredit everything Khalif Ryder is saying. They make him uh, recount uh, his attempted suicide because they don't believe that he tried to attempt suicide. So they asked him a number of times, like, 
You know, how did you do it? How did you bring it around? How did you put it around your neck? Did you twist it? Did you tie it? All this stupid stuff that's really irrelevant to the fact that you released him because you had no evidence on him. You didn't have a nowhere around. So, um, unfortunately, you know, we're just going to go with, sorry about that. We are just, you know, we, we, we really just, in, in, in all reality, we don't want to apologize for this and we don't want to, um, own up to the fact that we are the reason why you're here. Um, and so basically they make him go through this deposition where they ask him stupid questions, you know, do you know, what did you do in the fifth grade? Who was your teacher in the sixth grade? Did you like reading books? What books did you read? Do you know how many times you were absent in kindergarten? Like stupid stuff like that to try to discredit him in some way. It still doesn't make up for the fact that you incarcerated him for nothing. You kept him there for three years and you kept him in solitary confinement when he was only 16 years old. So uh, basically they go through that deposition. Um, they also go through, you know... Um, just the popularity that he received that I talked about before. Um, but we they also talk about the fact that no matter what Khalif was trying to do, uh, his lawyer even said it, and let me quote this correctly, that way I get it right. Uh, he said, his lawyer said he said he was cursed and tormented. And you see him go through different things. So um, Khalif uh, was robbed or whatever, Um and pretty much the neighborhood was like trying to punk him and trying to uh, make him fear and trying to take money from him. Because now that they see that he has a little bit of popularity, then that means that he has some type of money, which he really didn't. Um, and so they're trying to rob him. They're trying to punk him. And so Khalif was shot. But thank God, you know, um, it, it just grazed his body. Um, so he, uh, his brother... Uh, let me check on his name. It starts with a K. His brother's name was Kamal. Kamal is even um, put in a similar situation where they're asking for money for him because, oh, you're Khalif's brother. So clearly you have money as well. So and you know how Khalif is. Khalif has always been tough. Khalif has always shown masculinity. Even at a young age, he was like a little buff boy and so he's like look nobody punks my brother so they end up getting arrested uh for resisting arrest um due to the incident where they would try to pr pretty much protect themselves and so this just sparks Khalif's mind and uh puts him back in that Rikers Island place and puts him back in that place that uh started it all where did you have that book bag and then, no, I don't have the book bag. And then, bam, three years have passed. And, he, you know, he's, you know, he's done uh, time and incarcer he's incarcerated in the Rikers Island and then kicked, you know, taken out. So um, this is where, you know, people say, you know, he starts to change. Meanwhile, you know, while he's at the uh, university, he's excelling in everything. He has a 3.56 GPA. Um, they even have him uh, marked to go on this uh, trip that is sponsored by this group that takes previously incarcerated individuals uh out of the country or out of the town into nature, into rock climbing and fishing. And they, you know, release them where, you know, they can try to rid themselves of some of the things and memories that they've had, you know, so they, of course, interview Khalif for this and Khalif was a good fit. Unfortunately, you know, funds are not as available as, you know, you would like to be to just, you know, get people going quickly. And so unfortunately, Khalif um, has to wait. And uh, while he's waiting, the deposition is going on. And his lawyer is like, you can't do that right now because we're trying to fight this big case. And because Khalif wants to make sure that this case is taken care of, he decides that he cannot go at the moment, which probably wasn't the right decision. His mental health probably be, probably should have been placed in a, you know, in a higher position. And unfortunately, lawyers don't think that way. And I'm not saying at all that the lawyer was selfish or greedy or whatever at the time. It's just that it wasn't 
maybe that wasn't the right counsel for Khalif. Uh, so Khalif is dealing with all of these issues and yet still trying to navigate life, you know, and we can see, you know, if we just try to take a trip back down memory lane and we, we go post uh, slavery, I can see men, you know, just like in Khalif's situation where, you know, it's dog eat dog, you know, I'm trying to survive, you know, I think you have something that I don't, even though we're both poor, you know, so I'm going to do what I can to, to get what I need. And so that might mean that I step on your toes and that might mean that I do things, you know, to harm you and to hurt you because in my mind, I'm just trying to make it and I'm just trying to take care of myself, you know, and I, you know, unfortunately, because Khalif was brought back to his, 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 his home, you know, it's the same way, you know, people are just trying to make it. And so bad decisions are made against our own people. Um, and I can just imagine that happening as well. You know, look, I'm trying to eat as well, you know? And so if you have food, I'm going to steal your food because I don't have food, you know, you get to eat. And, and sometimes I don't get to eat, you know? And so there's just a lot of similarities there. Let me know what some of the similarities that you saw that I, and then we get to the place where, um, Khalif's uh, commits suicide and his mother lets us know, you know, how that day went. You know, Khalif was very concerned about how she was, how she felt. You know, I think he knew that that was going to be the day that it was going to be over. <coughs> Excuse me. I think he knew that that was the day that it was going to be over. And I think he was preparing and wanted to hear from her that it was okay, that she was okay. And then also telling his brother, you know, I'm proud of you. I love you. And I just want you to know that. So I think he was preparing himself. And, I, and on my previous video, I even said, you know, I think Khalif knew that he had served his purpose, you know, and it wasn't even a money thing for him, you know, because to be honest with you, he could have waited until the trial was over, even though we, I mean, the deposition was over, even though we don't know how long that would have taken, but he could have waited until that deposition was over and then committed suicide. But I think Khalif had gained enough notoriety and enough talk where he knew his purpose was served. And I think the things in his mind were too heavy and he was like, it's time, you know, I think I've done enough you know, I'm ready to go. And I think that's why he did it in such a way that's like still a shock to me and I think his family, to everyone who's heard this story already. <clears throat> I think he wanted to make sure it was done um, and it was complete. And um, I know that is heartbreaking for his family and it's heartbreaking hearing that. But I think that his mind had got to a place where he was like, this is it. I'm done. Um, similar to the way that Jesus was like, it was, it is finished. And so, um, although suicide sucks and it's horrible and it's, and it leaves a lot of hurt and pain and you wonder why, and you wonder why they couldn't stay, um, For me, it was like, rest well, King. You know, for me, I felt, um, even hearing that part of the story, I felt peace because um, I think Khalif knew he served his purpose. Um, and I think he did a job well done. And I think he was tired. And I think that although there was torment and there and hurt and pain and a lot of things was going on inside that head, I think that collectively everyone said, you're done. You did what you're supposed to do. And so the, the quickest and easiest way to get it done was the way that he decided to do it. And I believe he's at rest and he's at peace. And that's the king. Um, it's a king move. Um, and 
I think he also knew that we weren't going to ever forget. And I think he sparked in us enough information that we don't have, we won't ever forget. Um, and we'll always share that memory. We'll always have that time. Um, and we'll always have those pictures and those images of him. And so we won't ever forget. And I think that's what he came to the conclusion. I did my work. They won't forget. Change will occur. We just have to carry out our part of the deal for him. And I think he did give us a deal. He said, okay, I did all this late, this, this work here. Now it's your turn. And so that's how he left. Like, now it's your turn. And so the next episode, I think what Khalif did was set the groundwork for his mom to start to pick up for him. Um, and so that's what we'll see in the last episode. So I'm looking forward to seeing Khalif's mom begin to put in the lead work and finish up what her son started. And so I'm excited to see that. So if you like this video, please uh, thumbs up for me. Uh, please leave a comment below. Look at the other videos. I hope you enjoyed uh, this review. I hope you got the same type of ideas and mindset that I did while watching it. This is Old School Heart. Have a good night.